Hello, and uh, welcome to our um, Summer of Weather Code final presentation. Um, thank you very much for, for having us here. I'm Tommy. And I'm Gabby. Um, and we were working together to look at the applications of machine learning to predict drought. Um, just quickly before we go on, I'd like to say thank you to ECMWF and Copernicus and our mentors, uh, Claudia, um, Stefan, Julia, and uh, Sean. So thank you very much. Um, but yeah, so we today are going to talk to you about, um, first of all, the kind of motivation for this project and kind of what we set out to do. Um, secondly, go through the goals of the project. And then Gabby's going to take you through an overview of the pipeline that we've built for machine learning, which is kind of the core product um, that we produced during this four-month period. Um, he's then going to explain the kind of key uh, model that we used for making our drought predictions. Um, and then I'm going to just take you through some of our kind of preliminary experiments. Um, so we spent a lot of our time kind of developing the pipeline, and the experimentation stage was kind of um, it's still very initial, and we're really excited to explore it more. So if you have any more ideas or see any patterns that we haven't yet picked up on, we're super keen to hear, um, hear from you. So who are we? Um, I'm a PhD student at, at Oxford, um, and I'm looking at uh, understanding and monitoring droughts in East Africa. So this is kind of very relevant to my PhD. And, uh, I'm a machine learning engineer in uh, uh, Cambodia, working with the uh, energy data helping build solar microgrids. And um, together, I think we've been, I've been really lucky to have such a good team with kind of complementary skill sets from the kind of machine learning world and uh, um, hydrology and uh, drought world. And so we were focused on predicting um, agricultural drought in Kenya. Um, the reason we focused on Kenya was because um, it's a region of the world that has experienced a number of um, damaging droughts in recent decades. And we expect um, to well, there, there is evidence to suggest that we're probably going to see um, more frequent and uh, longer droughts in the region um, with the impacts of climate change. Um, and the reason we chose an agricultural drought index was that um, comparatively understudied compared to precipitation um, droughts, and also because the National Drought Monitoring Authority of Kenya use um, the metric that we're going to be using, the Vegetation Condition Index, as a decision threshold for when they release emergency drought contingency funds. So it made sense to try and add some value by um, providing a, a kind of a bit of a lead time. So rather than just doing it retrospectively, trying to see how, whether we can predict the vegetation condition ahead of time. Um, so next, we're just going to quickly go through our goals for a project. And like all good projects, these goals have not changed at all. Um, so our, our um, I'll kind of overview our pipeline, I think, we summed up with a, a little poem. So, um, forgive me, but uh, ML is hard for me and you, and weather is tough for others too. Interpretability makes us all fearful, so we wrote some code to make it cheerful. Um, and I think that kind of summarizes what we're doing. Focus particularly on interpreting machine learning models, um, and we'll hopefully be able to give you a kind of flavor for how we've gone about doing that. Um, but yeah, the key insight is kind of bringing together these two communities, the climate and weather community and the machine learning communities. And so what, what we actually ended up building was um, a, a tool that can be, that kind of uses um, good software engineering practices, so like unit testing and um, the ability to kind of chop and change different parts is very modular in its structure. Um, and it has a number of different machine learning methods built into the pipeline that can be tested for arbitrary inputs and outputs. Uh, so the kind of key questions that we're looking at answering are kind of how, how does machine learning perform? Um, what is it that the models are learning? And what can we interpret that the models are learning? And how do we ensure usability? And so now I'm going to hand over to Gabby, who's going to give you a flavor of uh, the pipeline that we've built. Um. Yeah, so uh, as Tommy mentioned, this pipeline was uh, one of the core deliverables that we saw uh, as a result of this project. Uh, and we had, uh, I would say, three big goals um, with respect to this pipeline. The first was that it had to be extensible. So we didn't want to build something that could only be used to uh, forecast drought in Kenya in 2019. Uh, we wanted something that 
would be where it would be easy to add new data sources uh, as well as to run different experiments. Uh, the second is that it's uh, easy to rerun, so something where anyone else could uh, take what we built and hopefully reproduce our results, uh, as well as do it like, in an easy and intuitive way, so user friendly. And the final one is uh, we wanted a robust pipeline. And as Tommy's already mentioned, that's mostly just uh, loads of tests. Uh, we have a B plus up there because uh, I'd say that that's roughly like uh, we've, one of the challenges was managing the tensions between experimenting with all of the different ideas we had, but also like you know writing documentations and things like this. So uh, we're nearly there in terms of, of satisfying these three points, but uh, a little bit more work as well as necessary. Cool. So uh, how did we go about achieving these things? Uh, this is uh, basically what our pipeline looks like. And, and the key idea is that we decouple the data sources from the experiments themselves. Uh, and this means that it's very easy to, when you add a new data source, without, write, without changing any code past these preprocessors, uh, it automatically gets included into your pipeline. Uh, so our pipeline consists of five steps. The first is these exporters. Uh, these are data source specific um, and basically interact with different data stores to download the data to a local location. Then these preprocessors, like all of these different data sources that will be downloaded will have their own quirks. Um, they'll all be on different spatial grids. Maybe they'll be on different time grids. Um, so these preprocessors basically uh, massage everything into this unified data format. And it's thanks to this unified data format that the uh, engineer, which turns everything into matrices, which can be input into machine learning models, uh, doesn't need to care about where the data comes from because it already knows that the data is going to look like that. Uh, and then Thanks to that, it's easy to write loads of different models and easily uh, run different experiments. So I'm just going to talk quickly about some of the data sources that we currently have access to. So one of the key deliverables from Copernicus was to use, and ECM the yeah, was to use the um, era, era 5 data on the uh, climate data store. And so that's kind of probably the key component of our data. But we also wanted to augment that with other data sources. So we're using like chirps for precipitation, for example, we, I don't have the diagram here, but we have topography from a um, digital elevation model. And our target variable is actually a satellite-derived um, vegetation health metric called Vegetation Condition Index, VCI. And so we've taken that from the NOAA FTP servers. But the whole point of the pipeline is that it each individual class inherits behavior from a base class. So it's very easy to extend it by just writing a, um, a kind of wrapper onto your new data source. So we can experiment very quickly by adding new data sets. Yeah, and then also, as Tommy's mentioned, uh, it was very important to us that uh, you get, uh, we could interpret the results of our models, so we could like figure out what patterns our models are learning. Uh, so uh, the technique we used, so the model that we used was uh, a neural network, and so the technique we used uh, was called deep lift. Uh, basically, what the model does is uh, we change the, back the way the backpropagation is calculated, if you're familiar with machine learning. Uh, but to basically figure out how the input data points uh, affected the model's final prediction relative to what we would consider the model's prior, which is the mean of the data set that it's seen already, so the mean of the training data set. Uh, and so this is just a quick example of uh, one of the graphs that we can generate. And uh, so the dashed line is the value of precipitation for uh, the data that the model can see, which is the year preceding the prediction it has to make. Uh, so in this case, the model is predicted predicting uh, vegetation condition in March 2018. And the orange line is how uh, each data point affected the model's prediction. So here you see that the model saw what um, precipitation was in February, and it decreased its prediction for vegetation condi condition uh, by four. So yeah, just a, a useful way to basically uncover what patterns the model is seeing. Uh, yeah, and then. Uh, Lots of unit tests, time checking, just uh, engineering, like software engineering practices that allow us to be confident that the model is doing what we expect in there. Yeah, and so uh, the model that we focused the most on was uh, this uh, EALSTM. Uh, and this was introduced recently. Uh, and it's uh, the motivation for its introduction was uh, large scale hydrological modeling. Basically, the motivation behind this model is that uh, you have all of these, like, variables which vary over time, 
Um, and that's what uh, long short-term memory networks are very good at modeling. But uh, in the case of uh, hyd hydrological modeling, and also in the case of drought modeling, you have variables that are static as well that you also want to consider when you're looking at the, so for instance, topography doesn't really change over time. So you want a way to communicate that to the model as well. Uh, so the, the change is, is really subtle, but um, in a classic LSTM, uh, the update which happens here uh, is conditioned on the temporal data, so on the dynamic data, uh, and the update which happens at the same point uh, in the EA LSTM is conditioned on this static data, so maybe the topography or, or the land cover type. Yeah. Uh, and the way that we basically uh, created the model using the ALSTM was to just take the final uh, hidden state of the last ALSTM cell uh, to calculate the final predictor and the VCI. Yeah. Uh, and so I'd just like to show you some of our um, results that we, we've got. And so I think for most of these results, we're comparing to a persistence baseline. Um, so just bear that in mind when we're looking at it. So the experiments that we're running um, at the moment, so one of the key things that we've mentioned is that the pipeline has this kind of experimental flexibility, which is awesome because it means that you can choose different inputs and outputs. You can choose different ways of using the data in your machine learning models. But what we did for our initial experiments, just to kind of proof of concept and show that the pipeline works, is we're taking um, the 12 previous time steps of our kind of input variables, which here are precipitation, temperature, soil moisture, and then two evaporation measures, one potential and one kind of real evaporation, um, and then also the static data in terms of the topography. They're fed into the machine learning model, in this case our EA LSTM, um, to produce a prediction of vegetation condition index. So we're making a one month ahead forecast based on the previous 12 months of information. And so in this plot, the main thing to take, take away is that the orange line is more or less below the blue line. Um, that, that shows us that the model is performing better than the persistence baseline, um, particularly uh, in, the, in the rainy season. So for those of you that know your East African climate, uh, there's two rainy seasons, March, April, May, and October, November. We, seem to, we do a lot better in the um, October, November season, which is in, important because that's probably the time when a failed rainy season can have really damaging impacts. The other thing that I think would be really interesting, um, or I would like for you guys to take away from this, is these are the kind of plots that we can produce with the pipeline. And so as you said, it's very, very flexible. And that's the key kind of takeaway and the key focus for us, with building this experimental workbench that can produce these different um, plots and bit, different bits of analysis. And so here we've got a kind of comparison of the results um, in April, which is a month where we perform particularly well. Um, and you can kind of see that, yes, we're under predicting uh, the low levels, um, which is probably what's important for droughts, but we need to look more uh, further into that. But more or less, we're capturing the shape. And in the spatial patterning, you can kind of see this is the true values, the kind of observations. And these are our predictions from the EASDM model. Um, however, it's not the same across, across the year. There are certain months that we find harder to predict. And so in May, we seem to have a particular problem. Um, we seem to be kind of consistently over predicting um, the vegetation condition index. Um, these are, again, a comparison of our baseline against the model. And you can see more or less that the uh, EASDM, the model that we're kind of having testing here, uh, performs better than the persistence pretty much across the country. So a more yellow or more washed out color means uh, worse performance. So we've got R squared over here, so the yellow, low R squared means there's low correlation, whereas um, I me root mean squared error means that we're, our error is greater. Um, there are interesting spatial patterns here, and the kind of spatial complexity of these predictions um, kind of suggests to us that there's more information that we're probably missing. Um, in our predictions. Something that we wanted to do, another reason that we chose this agricultural drought index was that there have been a number of studies that have kind of compared, um, have, have already used machine learning methods, and so we were comparing against them as well. And what you can see here is that their um, predictions for these different counties, which are under their um, 
under the scheme by which they get paid uh, remittances if there is a drought. Um, these are the places that they chose to test the model. And we tend to be better in, or, or similar in most of the counties except for Takana. Um, we haven't actually identified exactly why that is. But something that I really want you to bear in mind here is that the Adidi et al. paper is using a three-month aggregated mean. So a three-month mean and a mean in each, um, each county, whereas we're producing pixel-level predictions and aggregating them at the end. So with, if we were doing uh, predicting the same thing as them, I'm pretty confident that we would be outperforming them, given that we're able to perform competitively, even though our granularity and resolution is much, much higher. Yeah, and also in terms of uh, the patterns of the model, model of learning, model is learning. Uh, one of the other nice things about looking at them is that you can kind of test them against your intuition. Yeah. Here, uh, by and large, our initial uh, analyses have, have made us pretty confident. So, for instance, here you get uh, uh, wrongly labeled. Uh, the vegetation health is, uh, in terms of magnitude, the most important uh, feature, which makes sense. Also, the last three months uh, tend to have a very big impact on the model's predictions. Also makes sense. And then finally, just to show that here you can see the evolution of, uh, we call them shock values, these orange the evolution of shock values over time. But we can also plot them uh, over space. Uh, for uh, for the static variables, but also for the non-static ones. It's just uh, different ways to look at what the model is learning. And so this basically tells you how important is a feature for uh, for the model. Um, and so just uh, before we wrap up, um, I wanted to just put these on on the slide to kind of give you an idea of what we've been doing for the last four months. Um, so you can see we've kind of written a lot of Slack messages to each other. This is actually the first time we've met in person, and I feel like we know each other pretty well over the last four months. But um, yeah, there's a lot of lines of Python code and a lot of tests, but we're, we're really proud of the pipeline and we really hope to share it um, and keep developing and keep working on it. Um, so thank you very much for listening and uh, we're happy to take your questions. Okay, uh, are there any questions? Yes, we have two already, okay. What is the truth, or how do you know the truth? <laughs> Sorry, that was a, that's a very good point. I did I probably misspoke by saying that, but um, that is the satellite based measurement of the vegetation condition index, which of course comes with its own uncertainties and errors. Um, but that is our observation, and that's what we're using as our target variable. So, uh, and that pretty sensible philosophical answer, but. <laughs> Yeah, that was a very well presented. <laughs> Hello, that's Okay, yeah. Uh, a very well put together presentation and a, a massive amount of coding. That's impressive. Uh, I myself have been I'm biased on the genome by any means, but I have been involved in a project. Next to the sheet learning, not using the sheet learning, which has some parallels to what you've been doing. So when, I, when we started out on this, they, one of the first things they told me is that the volume of the data that you need to train the model to be successful. And they said, I think you want at least 10,000 cases. Uh, I think in the world of, especially you're in the world of seasonal forecasting, you're never really going to get that. I wonder how, uh, what, what, what do you would say to that? Yeah. Are we first? Yeah, I guess uh, for us, we did have. Uh, Way more than 10,000 cases, and, it, and it, it, the reason is, is because of how we framed our problem. So, uh, uh, if you look at what we were predicting, we predicted on a pixel-wise uh, basis. So that means that we had 30 years of data, and then we also had, like, I think this resolution is roughly 300 by 300, so thousands of points per per month to predict, and so. Uh, that a lot. Yeah, and that's something that we, uh, it's part of our future work, but that's definitely something that we're aware of and thinking about, but not captured it right now. Example. We've got like a, how about next very important the network as such? I mean, how many people are the network set? Sorry, could you repeat? I didn't hear that. Sorry. How many people are feeding the network? So, like hundreds or millions or billions or. 
uh, it's something we'll have to check. Um, but as you saw, the network is, is actually relatively simple because it's only got this EALSTM layer followed by a linear layer, but I couldn't tell you exactly yeah. how many. In the context of what I've been doing, I mean, to me that question sounds like how many, not quite saying, but how many variables are you using in your model? Okay, so I, I understood the uh, question is how many parameters uh, are we trying to learn? Uh, okay, yeah, so I would be able to tell you. In terms of... Yeah, on on the magic, it would probably be a thousand. Yeah. Input parameters. No, 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 no. The number of input parameters we have is, is as Tommy showed, those five input variables. Yeah, um, yeah, over 12 months. So each instance consisted of roughly 50. Oh, and we had a bunch of aggregations as well. So in the hundreds of, of input variables. One of the ways that that's right. One of the ways I think that we can justify that is that well, I don't know if this is as good a justification as it could be. But in the Kratzer paper, they're using a, a much higher dimension. Um, a much higher number of input parameters than we, we are. So um, the other thing to say is that our performance did go up by a large amount by adding more input parameters. And we did compare it against much more simple models and found that, um, yeah, we, we think that adding the complexity kind of is justified given the improve, improvement in performance. Okay, good. So let's thank you, Tommy and Gabby.